Hello, everyone. Attorney Sam here. My guest today will be Kyle Kaplan, who is the brand ambassador for Rare Champagne. And there he is now. Hi, Kyle. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Doing well. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, happily. Great day to drink champagne. Absolutely. It's always a great day to drink champagne. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. As I mentioned, Kyle is the brand ambassador for both uh, Piper Hideseek and also for Rare Champagne. And today we're going to be talking about mostly Rare Champagne and how it started, what makes it special, uh, a little bit of the differences that they use in their blending process compared to the other sim, uh, champagne houses. Uh, we're also going to get into a little bit about what Kyle does on a daily basis and some of the fantastic events he gets to attend in his role. <laughs> and then we're going to be tasting the, uh, the 06 edition of Rare Champagne which is absolutely fantastic. If time permits, we're going to be showing you some examples of some of the absolutely outstanding bottling and packaging and labeling that Rare Champagne uses, which really reinforces uh, their image and I think is actually, in addition to being extremely cool, it is actually something that definitely reinforces their image and is consistent with the the quality that you can expect uh, when you drink rare champagne. And so with that, I think, Kyle, to get started, if you could maybe tell us a little bit about rare champagne and, and how it started and the, the inspiration behind it. Sure. So uh, rare champagne really started, uh, the, the origins are actually Marie Antoinette. Uh, Piper Heitzig was the uh, champagne of Marie Antoinette. Um, so fast forward 100 years, we paired up with uh, Fabergé to make a bottle. Uh, a very special bottle, so hand-blown glass, and they encrusted with jewels. And then fast forward another 100 years, we decided to kind of do something with that. Um, and the very first vintage, uh, which was 1976, so an unusually warm year. Um, and they wanted to mark that warm year and make a rare champagne out of it. Uh, so they kind of uh, brought back the bottling that Fabergé did. And uh, I think it's really cool, even if you look at the bottle today, um, you know, it's a mold after the original hand-blown glass. You can tell this shoulder is a little bit higher than this shoulder. It's not perfect, right? Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's a really cool thing because it, you know, just shows like the heritage of the brand. Um, so 1976, um, the very first vintage, the, the chef de cave at the time decided, you know what, I'm going to mark this occasion. I'm going to make our very first rare champagne. Um, so we did. And the blend has always been the same, right? Always 70% Chardonnay, 30% Pinot Noir. Um, and we've only made nine vintages of the non-vintage brut since then. So we really are very, very selective about the years that we do it. And that's why it's called rare, because it's, it's very rarely made. Exactly. You're exactly right with that. Um, so also at the same time, just talking about the bottle a little bit, uh, we paired up with a jeweler at the time uh, named Arthur Bertrand, uh, who was a jeweler in uh, Paris. And we said, you know, come to uh, Champagne and get inspiration and help us make a bottle. Uh, and we want you to also gain inspiration. The reason why we used a jeweler is because we had already done Fabergé 100 years before. So we really like that collaboration. Uh, so he went out there and we had already harvested the grapes in 1976. So they were kind of going dormant for the winter. So he said, they're not, they're not dying fields. They're beautiful golden fields. So to mark that, he put a beautiful golden tear on the bottle, which is yeah. really stunning. Each one of these are put on by hand to this day. And it's and actually uh, detachable. And, you know, many times that, you know, towards the end of the night, people actually do detach it and wear it. <laughs> yes, I happen to always have a tiara <laughs> handy because yeah. you you never know. Somebody always gets somebody always gets queened, right? Yeah. So that's always good fun at the end of the night too. So absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Usually the first person to uh, not remember where we could take a lot of videos. That's the person who gets to wear it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and also because of he's a jeweler, we also always have a, this gold uh, ring around the top, right? Because he's a jeweler. He's got to put a ring on it, right? Yep. So yeah, let, exactly. me, let, me, let me crack this bottle here. Um, there we go. My speeches are much better when I have champagne in front of me. Yeah. Hopefully it's everybody else has some champagne in front of them too. Yes. So um, that was really the inspiration behind Rare was, um, you know, Marie Antoinette followed by Fabergé, followed by um, the jeweler. Now the vintages that we made a Rare are um, 1976, as I mentioned, 1979 was the next one, uh, 1985, 88, 90. Then we went all the way to 96, uh, I'm sorry, uh, we went to 98, my apologies, we went to 98 and then we did 99 
and then 2002, and finally we're on the 2006. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, there's been a question, what is it that determines whether or not you make a vintage? Because uh, just listening to the years that you mentioned, for example, you would expect that 96 might be a standout vintage that might lend itself to a, a rare champagne. Why would you skip 96, for example, and then produce one in 99? Um, you know what? It's, uh, it's pretty interesting because, you know, we put a lot of reserve wines into our uh, Piper Heitzig non-vintage fruit. And uh, we did come out with a regular Piper Heitzig vintage that year. But my chef de Cove decided that we needed to replenish our reserves. And so he decided to not make a rare. Okay. So Because rare is pre- it's, it's all predominantly Grand Cru Champagne that goes into it. And so we really needed that for the Piper Heitzig non-vintage fruit. Okay. In so many years, there's, uh, there's no rare champagne produced. It will always go into the Piper Hyde Seed. Exactly. Yeah. You know, we own um, about 12% of our vineyards, um, but we buy the rest of the fruit, right? We're a negociant. Um, but a lot of these relationships that we have don't go, you know, year to year, but more like decade to decade, generation to generation. They are long, long relationships. Um, you know, some of them generation, uh, many generations you know, that, that, that we're buying the same fruit from the same people who've been growing it, right? Father to son and so on and so forth, which is really cool. Yeah, no, definitely. Oh, I'm sorry. I was ahead. just going to say, um, since then, we've also released two rare rosé vintages, um, but they're pretty recent. Uh, we just did the 2007 and the 2008 is our newest one. But the 2007, we did not release very much. We only released 2007 bottles of the first one. We don't make a whole lot of that one. Yeah, I still haven't tried the uh, the rosé champagne yet. I'm looking forward to doing that. Certainly, I'd imagine the um, the 08 is very very nice as well. It's beautiful. Yeah, they're both beautiful. I have to say, uh, the 08 has a very special place in my heart. You know, just an incredible vintage, um, and it just has like that, you know, pale color and strawberries, and just is amazing. And do you anticipate there might be an 08 vintage of the rare as well? I could anticipate that. But it hasn't I been couldn't, announced as, as, as I couldn't announced. I couldn't say I couldn't say anything officially, but I could anticipate something like that coming around the bend at some point. Okay. You wouldn't be surprised if it happened. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if it happened. No. Yeah. No, no. no. But we have lots of the, we have a good amount of the two thousand six and the two thousand six is screaming right now. It is. No, it's it's really outstanding. So uh, we'll, we'll get to that in, in just a second. But before we do, could you maybe uh, explain what it is you do as brand ambassador and then maybe talk about some of the outstanding events that you get to attend in there? Sure. So um, sales, marketing, events, anything to do with Piper Heights or Rare Champagne, I'm your guy for half the U.S. and half of Canada. So I come to Texas, uh, do luncheons, sommelier luncheons, uh, dinners, <laughs> the six liter. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm the person to go and sell it to all the right accounts uh, to make sure that people have places to go drink this wonderful juice. Um, and some of the events that we get to go to, yes, Piper Heitzig is the champagne of the Oscars. So I have gone to the Oscars uh, this past year and to the Governor's Ball the past six years before that, uh, which is pretty fun. We were uh, very synonymous with the movies, actually with Piper Heitzig specifically. Uh, so we do like the American Cinematheque. We do the Cannes Film Festival. Uh pretty much everything with movies, which is really fun. Excellent. So. No, that's great. Anyone at the Oscars who's particularly into champagne that you can mention? Or? I mean, the Oscars is the last uh, event of the year. So I think that night, everybody is into champagne. Right. <laughs> uh, I usually hang out at the champagne of the rare bar that's, that's at the Oscars. And it's, I mean, everybody bellies up. No problem, right? Of course, we're passing it all around. It's at every single station. But what if you have like the rare champagne bar there? I mean, it's really striking and uh, I've definitely shared some pretty fun celebrities with that one. Yeah. And do you have the, the whole lineup there or just certain, certain bottles? Um, usually we just, this past year, we just had the uh, Piper Heights Ignite Vintage Brew. We come up with a specific label for every single Oscars. So this last one is a, a throwback to the uh, Prohibition. So we actually brought back the label that we had during Prohibition, the bottles that were never actually allowed inside the U.S. Oh, cool. Uh, we finally are allowing them in, right, legally. I mean, they still got here, but <laughs> uh, so, uh, and those will be coming out uh, for public consumption um, a little bit closer to the end of the year. But uh, the, the ones that are actually on the Oscars actually say the Oscars on it. And we don't get to sell those commercially, as you could expect. The Oscars are very, um, they, they cover their brand very well. For sure. Yeah. Now, as an attorney, I, I certainly appreciate that. So 
Uh, but yes. no, that, that's interesting that that uh, that label will actually be out later this year then. Exactly. Yeah. So it's a little bit more of like a brown label. Just it's a it's a great throwback to the twenties. Now that we're back in the twenties. Right. No, that's cool. So yeah. And then, um, so, and then in the, um, engraving room, we, we always have either rare 2002 this past year, the year before that, we had the rare 98 magnums. Uh, there was a really fun picture of, of one of the winners spraying, uh, rare 98 magnum across everybody when he was getting engraved. It was really fun. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that sounds like a lot of fun. So, uh, well, should we go ahead and turn to the, uh, the 06? Yes, absolutely. So the 2006 rare, um, you know, we did change a couple of things with the 2006. If you see it versus like the 2002, the R is a little bit different. Um, one of my favorite things is the tear is a little bit easier to get off uh, before you needed like a steak knife. Now you can kind of do it with a, with a fingernail, which is really interesting. Um, so kind of our same blend that we go with always, right? 70% Chardonnay, 30% Pinot Noir. Now, um, what's interesting is where we're actually pulling this fruit from. So um, the Pinot Noir is all coming from an area called the Montagne de Reims, so the Mountain of Reims, really um, an area known for some of the best Pinot Noir in the world, right? So you've got vineyards such as like Ambonnet and Bouzy, so just like these rock star Grand Cru vineyards inside of there. And then um, we're pulling half of the Chardonnay from an area called the Côte de Blanc, so the area known for some of the best Chardonnay in the world. Uh, and so... Um, we're pulling from Cremant, Auger, Luminous Auger. So once again, just these rock star Chardonnay Grand Cru uh, villages, right? And then what's interesting is that uh, we actually pull Chardonnay from the northern part of the Montagne de la So an area dominated by Pinot Noir. Uh, we actually grow some Chardonnay up there and uh, we put it in here. And so everything else is Grand Cru except for that. And I, I asked my winemaker, Regis Camus, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. I'm like, why don't you just leave it out and call it Grand Cru? He goes, I don't care about Grand Cru. I want the best champagne possible. And we need that Chardonnay from there to give it like the distinctive characteristics that Rare always has. You know, we're not just going for just like this pure minerality standpoint with Chardonnay. You know, we want to bring in a lot of like these tropical notes that you really get from the more northern part, actually, yeah. which is great. And so for those who are new to Rare Champagne, what are, I guess, the uh, distinguishing characteristics that you would, you would identify when you taste it? So um, Rare Champagne, we tend to release things a little bit later than most people. So we're on 2006. Uh, these 2006 bottles were disgorged uh, last year, in fact. So we're talking 13 years aging on the lees. Um, now, how that translates is the... Um, you know, by law, you have to age a tête cuvée, which, which this is, right? Or a prestige cuvée, meaning like the best of the best. By law, you have to age it for five years on the lees, meaning that the dead yeast that has made the, the bubbles during that secondary fermentation die, it goes through this process called autolysis, which basically means it's imparting these flavors of the yeast into the champagne. We tend to hang on to it much longer than most people. So you're always going to get a little bit of a yeasty characteristic in rare. Um, also, because we're Chardonnay dominant, you get these... Um, wonderful like bright minerality sort of characteristics as well but because we have the pinot noir it also has this like structure that, that goes on to it as well so you really have like this like great harmony between um structure and yeast and that beautiful minerality and i also think that rare tends to have uh because of that uh northern montagne de Reims chardonnay it tends to have a lot of um tropical fruits to it as well right yeah, so kind of like that yep. mango pineapple kiwi yeah, I was getting a lot of that, and then also a lot of the uh, the gunflint, the toast, the br uh, brioche, uh, a lot of those things that I really, really enjoy in champagne. Uh, it, it's there pretty much from inception, where with some of the others on the market, they oftentimes have to age for a while before they develop some of those characteristics that I like so much. Absolutely. You know, one of my favorite parts about rare champagne um, is that for somebody who's like a real champagne connoisseur, right? You can pull out all these flavors, right? Everything you said, and then like cocoa and nutmeg and all these different things. And it's, um, and it's really interesting and intricate, but for somebody who doesn't necessarily know champagne as, uh, in depth, it's still very pleasurable to drink. You know, you're not, you're not trying to geek out too much. It just, it tastes amazing and it just is smooth and it just, the bubbles are small and delicate and it just dents on your tongue. Yeah, no one's ever sent it back, to my knowledge, that I've uh, no, never <laughs> that I've served it. That, so that never happens. Yeah. No. And so we actually have a question from Philippe. Uh, Nick Sam has joined, and he's actually wondering about the the oldest vintage of, of rare champagne that's available in the market. So the oldest that's available in the market is going to be uh, the 1988 
Uh, we did a late disgorgement on that one, and that one kind of just came back around again about a year ago. Um, it's a little bit tough to track down, but we can get it anywhere. If somebody has a request for it, uh, it'll go through the proper channels, eventually get to me, and I'll make sure that bottle gets to where it needs to go. And those are recently disgorged as well, within the past two years. Ah, uh, look at yeah, that. There we go. Yeah. That is the rare 88. So you even see that those bottles are numbered, uh, or the uh, the cases are numbered on it on the right, uh, I believe. Um, is that showing up now? It's not showing up. No, go a little bit further down. Ah, there you go. Yep. Yes. So we've not made a ton of these. And it comes with a really cool champagne thermometer, too. So just to make sure you have that, like, the perfect champagne temperature. Yeah, it was my understanding that there were five of those that made it in the state of Texas, and I managed to get my hands on two of them. So ah, that's I've great. Done pretty well so far. So you have. That's <laughs> but fantastic. It's good to know that there's more available. So I may, uh, I may reach out after we're done here. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Because, yeah, I was going to say, uh, 2002 has long been one of my favorite champagnes ever, and in, in Texas in particular, all uh, my friends and I we go through a ton of it, and we've had some events where there's you know multiple bottles that that are consumed at the end of the night if we have uh, special occasions and so forth, but. Um, that was all before I ever tried the 88. And then all of a sudden, once I was mostly gone, you know, my 2000s were, 2002s were mostly gone. I tried the 88. I said, what the hell have I done? I mean, I could have uh, <laughs> aged it and it could have gotten even better. So it, it was drinking yeah. so well early on that it never occurred to me that I could age it that long and it would just keep getting better. But the 88 was even at another level than the 02. Yeah, you really, with the 88, you really see how like those like fruit flavors kind of go to the back end and you get these secondary flavors that come really strong in the front. And then, but that acidity just holds it up. I mean, you can hold on to that bottle for a long time. I mean, I think the 2002, you've got a solid 20 years mm. from now without any sort of issue of, of aging potential. But yeah, I, I, unfortunately we are out of the 2002 at the winery. We're out of the 2002 just about everywhere. Whoever has it on the shelves now, that's going to be the last of it, which breaks my heart because it, <laughs> That's like, that's like of all the rare champagnes, that one like has like the closest part to my heart, right? That's the one I've had the most. It's the one that I am in love with. Yep. Yeah. That's this bottle. And there were actually two different releases of the O2. Is that correct? That's correct. So you've got the older release. So do you see at the top of the neck, you've got uh, the plastic uh, ring. So that's how we originally were doing it. And then on the last disgorgement um, of the red 2002, we went to this ring. So the non-plastic, but the sticker. And so that's how you know if it's the early disgorgement or the later disgorgement, right? It's subtle. It's a subtle change. Uh, but we want to do it so that people kind of have like, it's a little inside track, right? You, the, the people who know, know. Yep. And, and so could you explain the, uh, the distinction between the two? When you, uh, if you would taste them blind, would you be able to tell the difference, for example? And how would they differ? Yes, you can. You 100% can. Um, so what's interesting is that Obviously, the, the earlier ones, right, they tended to age a little bit quicker. And what's very interesting is the dosage was a touch higher. And the second release, the, the dosage dropped down by about a gram and a half, two grams um, to create the balance, right? Because we're looking for harmony. And, and we decided that as it aged, as it gained this complexity, we're like, oh, let's lower the dosage a little bit to just like really let that show. But I mean, they're both perfectly in harmony. It's just a slight difference. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, and for those who don't know, the dosage is the amount of sugar that we had after the secondary fermentation. So um, it's the very last step that, that we do is we add just a touch of sugar to, to find the balance. And so um, the original one was about 11 grams per liter. Uh, the latest disgorgement was about nine grams per liter of sugar. Um, which, to put that into perspective, Coca-Cola is 112 grams per liter of sugar. Uh, champagne is only about 60 calories per full glass. Yeah, so, so it's practically a health food then. <laughs> it, I, I, it absolutely is. And so what are some of your other uh, favorite vintages besides 2002? So the 98 is, definitely has a special place in my heart. Um, so we hadn't made rare since 1990, and then we jumped all the way to 1998. And uh, my winemaker, Regis Camus, is very audacious. Uh, so a, kind of a funny story. Um, uh, the marketing team actually told me this last time I was in France. Um, they said on a, in 1998, on a, on a late Friday afternoon at like 4.45, he popped his head in the marketing team's office and said, hey, guys, guess what? I'm going to make a, a rare champagne. He said, that's great, you know, because he hasn't made it in eight years. And then he's like, and I'm going to put it in magnums. And they said, that's great. You should definitely put some in magnums. And he said, no, no, you misunderstood. 
I'm only putting in magnums. Have a good weekend. (laughs) And you turn around and you ran away, right? Because to not make this wine for eight years and then to put it only in a magnum is just um, like, who does that? Who does that? Um, Regis Kimu is the guy who does it for sure, right? He knew that that champagne was going to take extra long uh, to age to really come into its own. Uh, and he was exactly right. You know, um, what if I first tried the rare 19, 1998? Um, it tasted a little tight to me, but because it is an amalgam, you know, amalgams age much slower. Um, it really kind of like fell into its own and then just like hit the stride that was just unbelievable. And right now it's, I mean, it, it's like defying the laws of physics. Like it tastes, it doesn't taste like it's, you know, 22 years old. It tastes like it's like 10 years old. It's really incredible. Um, you get that great exotic fruit as well, but then you get like those, like, those like really bright acid and just, I mean, it's stellar. I think you got like 98 points in one spectator even. Is that one still available or is that something you'd have to find in the secondary market as well? No, no, it's fully available. It's fully available. Yeah. So that's what we're using as our magnums right now in the States, which is great. So I definitely suggest um, to pick some up because it's not going to be around for too, too much longer. I would think probably close to like the end of the year, it'll, it'll probably be out of stock. Okay. And I know we had a question from someone in Virginia wondering about where to find rare champagne. Is it, is it widely available at retail stores in all the states? A, yes. Uh, just about every single state. Um, uh, think more fine wine shops, I would say. Um, is, is definitely like the place to, to get it. And you can always ask for it and, and anybody can bring it in, right? You go to your, your local wine store and be like, I really want to try a rare champagne. And I'm sure they'd be happy to bring it in for you. So what are some of your uh, favorite food pairings with rare champagne? And uh, if it varies by vintage or by whether it's uh, rosé champagne or, or the non-rosé, please uh, specify that as well. Yeah, so um, probably my favorite pairing uh that i've had is going to actually be with the rare 2002 and i had this roast chicken with like foie gras and truffles on it that was just like decadence match with decadence that was just like you couldn't have a bite and a sip and not just like have this giant smile on your face it's just absolutely spectacular was it um, the, with the rare was it at the nomad by any chance in new york it might have been at the nomad in yeah, Los it Angeles. sounds like their, their signature dish, but yeah, I guess yes. they have one in, uh, in Los Angeles now too, right? It, exactly. Yeah. yeah okay, great. No, that's a great it. dish. It's, yeah, you, you know your chicken. It's the best chicken I've ever had in my life, and yeah. it's just spectacular. Um, now, with the 2006, my favorite pairing, I like to go classic with this one, just caviar. Just okay. champagne and caviar. <laughs> that's all. Just yeah. keep it simple. Keep it happy, right? You don't need to put a bunch of... Uh, you know, creme fresh or anything, just, just take caviar, do a little caviar bump, eat it off your hand and, and have a sip of champagne and just smile because it's, <clears throat> that's what it's all about on that one. Um, with the rare 98, um, you know, I, I really enjoyed that one with, um, some shellfish, you know, uh, some like butter poached lobster, things like that, that just were spectacular. Um, the rare 88, I, you, no food pairing, just, yeah. just drink it. You know, I've, I've done a, a number of food pairings that work pretty well with it. Like you could do it with foie gras, which is really interesting. Like just like some like seared foie gras. That's a great choice. Um, you know, you kind of get like that creaminess and it's just, it's great. Um, yeah, those are, those are my favorites. And you really can't go, I mean, look, it's still champagne, right? So you can still go with some of the classic pairings. You know, you can go with truffle potato chips, which are always great. You know, you can even go fried chicken which is one of my absolute favorites. Oh, that is good, yeah. It was Go in ahead. Dallas, Texas. So I used to live in Dallas, and I used to work at a restaurant, and uh, I worked at a restaurant called Fairings inside the Ritz-Carlton, and uh, Dean Fairing used to do this Sunday fried chicken that was just, like, the best fried chicken I'd ever had. And I was, like, first-level sommelier, just, like, learning the ropes, and there was, there was a psalm there um, in Paul Bottomer, and I was talking to him, and I said, what do you pair – with fried chicken. And he said, well, champagne, of course. And I had that and it blew my mind. Oh, yeah, I didn't think really that. Good. And it just, I mean, this was 12 years ago, 14 years ago, almost. Yeah. If anyone has not tried that yet, by all means, they should go out and do it this weekend because that is a, an absolutely phenomenal pairing for sure. But I tend to agree with you though. I think that the, the more elevated, the, the better, the, the wine or champagne, the less, the, the less helpful it is to have food with it. So uh, definitely for the 88s, I agree. I would not do any food with it. Uh, I would probably just enjoy it on its own for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, I mean, it was all the rares have been made so well. You know, it's it's interesting. Um, 
I actually tasted every single rare uh, last time I was in France from start to finish, and each one was just spectacular. And it's like there was, it's it's amazing whenever you, there's no duds, you know, not a single dud in the mix. It's just all of them are perfect in their own way. Now let's talk a little bit about the rare rosé, shall we? And those pairings because I go a little bit different with that one. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of times um, I'll do the rare rosé, you know, kind of a little bit more traditional, you know, with like salmon or like, I actually like it with sushi, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. I think that sushi and the rare rosé, you know, you get like those like clean flavors, you know, delicate flavors, because you get those delicate flavors with the rare rosé. You're not looking to overpower. You're just looking for those like amazing balance, right? Especially like you get like that fatty tuna with a salmon, something, something kind of like along those lines. And it's just screams yeah how much uh still red wine is put into the uh the rosé uh, about six percent so it's pretty small yeah. then it's pretty small yeah yeah i mean it's kind of kind of average you know it's it's completely different than the piper heights like rosé sauvage which is the non-vintage rosé by them and they do uh, about 20 to 25 percent red pinot noir which is more than anybody else i know in the market and that one definitely i would be pairing more with like things you would pair with like Pinot Noir, you know, you could even go like braised short ribs with that one, you know, it's oh, completely yeah. different. Yeah. Could you explain how Mr. Uh, Camus uh, blending strategy then is, is a little bit different from some of the competitors. I think you may have touched on this a little bit, but uh, he doesn't look just for the straight rank or the grade, the prestige level. He just kind of goes yeah. by feel and in what he wants to develop. Yeah. So a little, little history on, on the man, Regis Camus, he's literally won the international wine competition, which is like the Oscars for winemakers, the best sparkling winemaker in the world, I think the past eight out of 14 years, uh, which is just crazy. I mean, this guy is an absolute legend, charming as you could ever imagine. And just, he's one of those people when he speaks, all of Champagne listens. Um, you know, he does not mind breaking rules at all. He'll do his own thing every single time uh, if he feels it's the right thing to do. And, and he knows the region so well. I mean, he's been with us for 23 years, something like that. Um, a good long time. Um, so he used to be the winemaker or our, our chef de cave for, uh, Piper Heitzig, Charles Heitzig and rare champagne. And then he wanted to cut back a little bit so that we put him on Piper Heitzig and rare champagne. And then he wanted to cut back a little bit more. Actually, I think he really wanted to retire. We told him, no, you're not allowed to retire. <laughs> you can just make rare now. And so I think he's happy just doing rare for us. Um, but yeah, he'll, he'll step out of the lines and color outside of the box without any sort of issue. You know, he'll, he'll put um, non grand crew in the rare and, and not even think twice because that's what it needs. You know, he doesn't care about the, a uh, the crew, right? Like these designations that were done eons ago, you know, he goes, no, this is what it goes great here. You know, he was one of the first ones to really uh, embrace the Cote de Bar right? The most southeastern region of Champagne. Um, you know, that's where he, he really thought that the red Pinot Noir from that area is so distinctive and it has such amazing qualities. And he's exactly right. You know, I've, I've had the Vin Claire, uh, the still version of from Pinot Noir from that region, right? Made into a full red wine. And it tastes like amazing red Burgundy, you know? And I'm like, it's delicious. And he goes, wait, I'm going to put it in the Rosé Sauvage. You'll see, you'll see how this changes and, and how it really elevates the wine. And so, you know, while everybody else was doing like these light frilly rosés he's like i'm gonna go outside of the box even the 2007 rare rosé um if you have a chance to taste it and you look at the color it's so bright and so vibrant that it almost looks like looking through the through like the red of like a stained glass window of a church it's just it, i don't know how he like sprinkled magic in it or something i don't know mm-hmm. it's, it's some fairy dust to, to make it be so bright yeah. And with uh, Piper Hideseek, it's my understanding, too, especially for the, uh, the non-vintage, that he uses more, uh, more Pinot Meunier in, in that because it, it drinks well younger and it shows well younger and also helps to keep the cost down. You know, um, we actually are a little bit more Pinot Noir heavy, actually. We're about 55% Pinot Noir, about 25% uh, Pinot Meunier, and then the balance is Chardonnay. Okay. Yeah, and so we, we, we tend to be more Pinot Noir driven on most of our wines, except for the rare when it comes to Piper Heidsick. Okay. How does that level of Pinot Meunier compare to some of your, uh, your competitors? Is it? Um, you know, everybody kind of does their own thing, you know, I think, I think when it comes to the Pinot Meunier. Um, you know, I really enjoy Pinot Meunier and, and, you know, kind of like how, how I always like to think about like what these, what these grapes add to the wine, right? I always like to think about um, building a house, right? So if you think of like the two by fours of the building, 
right? Like the structures of the building. That's what uh, Pinot Noir brings, right? It brings the structure, the backbone. If you think of like all the walls and the windows, right? That's what Chardonnay brings, right? It brings like the prettiness to it. But if you think about Pinot Meunier, I like to think about like the fireplace and the lighting, right? Bring it the warmth to the champagne, right? Like the homey feeling to the champagne. I think that's what Pinot Meunier brings. And, and so I really enjoy that grape. Unfortunately, it is not as long lived as Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Chardonnay being the most long lived, Pinot Noir right behind it, Pinot Meunier much shorter. You know, yeah. So that uh, any any champagne that has a uh, higher percentage Pinot Meunier would be one that's probably designed to be uh, consumed earlier in its lifetime. Correct. Exactly. Yeah, you see it most of the time in in non vintages because non vintages have already been aged and are ready to drink now. Uh, where vintages and tete cuvées they tend to keep a very small amount, if any. And and with rare, we don't put any Pinot Meunier. We we never have. Okay. So why is it that large formats for champagne are, are so much more desirable than, uh, than the 750s? And, and oftentimes there's a, a price premium on those. Well, for one thing, obviously, it takes a lot of glass to, to blow them. It takes a, a number of different things, specifically like the pressure that goes into it, right? There's a lot of pressure that goes into a, a magnum. And as people say, as scientists will tell you, magnum is a perfect size um, for surface area uh, of the wine. Right. So you have like the least amount of oxygen. But if you talk to my winemaker, he'll say something completely different along the lines of, well, you know, it's because a magnum is perfect for two people as long as one person doesn't drink. You know, that's a little bit more his stance on <laughs> on the magnums. Um, but yeah, so I think magnums are really just like the perfect size. And, and champagne's interesting in the fact that the larger the bottle, the um, more the, the the price goes up. Right. It, they're, they're definitely rarer. Right. You yes. don't make as much. You have to do special. You have to do special runs for magnums. You have to do special things. Yep. A little bit is more it, of a cost involved. Is it the same champagne that goes into the larger formats as the uh, the seven fifties? Yes and no. So everything from a three seventy five to a three liter is aged inside of the bottle that it's put in. One eight sevens, which which we don't have in the United States, um, or anything over that. They do the transfer method, so they take seven fifties and they pour it in, you know, under pressure and all that, and, and make it that way. So, such as like the six liter of rare two thousand two that we have available, um, that wasn't aged in the six liter; it was aged in seven fifties and then transferred into it. Typically, the uh, the bigger the format, the longer it will age as well. Is that exactly? But yeah, because yeah. the slow the slower it's going to age. Exactly, the slower. Um, it takes a little bit more time for it to come into harmony. Not always, you know, it depends on the style, but definitely I've, it, that's kind of like the rule of thumb. And it's not just with champagne, it's with all wine, right? Magnums are always going to age slower. And what is the uh, Le Secret? Ah, Le Secret. <laughs> yeah. So Le Secret is the champagne that was never supposed to happen. Uh, so in 1997, Regis Camus made a little over a thousand bottles, put them only in magnums, didn't tell anybody, stuffed them in the deepest, darkest part of our dungeon cellars, like where only the chef de cobs go, and literally didn't tell anybody. Um, you know, in order to be considered a vintage champagne, you actually have to declare a vintage to the CVIC, the governing body. You have to say, I made a vintage champagne, right? And like you, there's a bunch of extra laws that go along with it, right? Extra aging, blah, 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 blah. So he didn't do any of that. He decided that he was going to be his normal, you know, gunslinging rebel and just kind of make something and just kind of see how it goes. Um, so he did. Uh, and about two or three years ago, he went to the VP of my company and he said, I've got a confession to make. I did something I wasn't supposed to. At the time, they told me I'm not allowed to make a rare champagne. So I didn't uh, or I didn't officially. But I've got news for you. I actually did. And so I've got these bottles and then my the VP of my company is like, why are you telling me this right now? And he said, because it's ready. He said, and so, um, it's a very special bottling because we only made about a thousand, a little over a thousand. Uh, we really wanted to kind of showcase something special. And so the jeweler for Marie Antoinette was a company called Mellon Row. They are still the same family jeweler, right? Generation, generation, generation. We were the champagne of Marie Antoinette. So we decided to pair up with them and, and they really love the idea too. So we came out with the rare Le Secret. So you can see the bottle here. Oh, wow. A little bit, a little bit different than, than the other rares. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It makes my, uh, my 1988 box look kind of uh, basic. Yes. <laughs> so 
um, each, this is the Goldsmith edition. We actually made two editions of this one. Um, so still 70% Chardonnay, 30% Pinot Noir. Uh, the label on this is actually 24 karat gold plated and hand etched by oh, Melon wow. Um Still the 70% Chardonnay, 30% Pinot Noir, but we did something a little bit different because the purity of this one was so clean, we decided zero dosage. So absolutely no dosage on this one. It is oh, wow. as clean as you could possibly do it. The most pure form of uh, of rare. And it, it, whatever you open this, doesn't it kind of remind you of like Vincent Vega and Pulp Fiction opening like the case, you know, behind the absolutely. behind the counter. Yeah. <laughs> sort of reminds me of, you know, it's just, it's just, it's brilliant. Um, so yeah, so we worked with Melon Road to create that. And we also created uh, something called the Jewelry Edition with them. Um, which we made 10 bottles, uh, each of them with real jewels on it. Uh, unfortunately, they don't give me that one because I think the bottle costs 150000 Right. <laughs> uh, I wish I could have it on top of my wine fridge, but it's just not going to work out like that. Um, and so, so we came out with four editions of that. We've got the diamond, the ruby, the emerald, diamond, ruby, emerald, and uh, sapphire. And so each one has like a giant stone and gold i mean everything handmade and whoever buys it actually gets to go back to melon row and they take all the gold that's on there and make a specific piece for uh whoever bought the bottle so i think oh, we're down to maybe nice. four, four, four left four um, bottles left yeah four four bottles left in the okay. world of, of those oh wow but yeah. we have but, but, but the goldsmith edition uh the united states got the most of these and so i think that we are, have maybe 20 left Okay. So it's definitely a collector's item. So that one is still available? It's still available. Yep. And exactly. What what about the champagne inside the bottle? How does that compare to some of the others, like the ninety eight you described and in the eighty eight and some of these others? You know, I think it I think it has a little bit more of like a purity to it because it has that zero dosage and it just is like pure rare is kind of like what you're getting out of it. Um, it definitely has the age on it a little bit, right? Because it, it I mean, it's 23 years old, right? So it's definitely going to have a little bit of age. Um, the cost on it is about $1,500 a bottle for okay. a Magnum, but okay. they're only made in Magnums. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think the, the 1988 by comparison was about 500, uh, right. was my understanding. Exactly. So it's, a, it's yep. a little bit up from that, but not, not a whole lot on a per 750 basis. Yeah. And I think the 98 rare Magnum is right about that same price as well, right about the $500 mark. And, and for me, when I look back at my favorite vintage of champagne ever, I think it, it's probably 1976, uh, at least yeah. the ones I've had so far. Um, what do you think of the 1976? Have you had that that of the the rare champagne? And what were your impressions of that? I, sh I sure have. Um, I thought it was delicious, but if you want to know my honest truth, it was at the end of its life. It it, it right? didn't okay. didn't ha it didn't have a whole lot more. But what's interesting is that the 79 is still vibrant and amazing. So oh, really? the 79 is spectacular. Yeah. Okay. So, so if people can find out that on the secondary market, they should they should look for the 79 and, and not so much the 76. Agreed. Yep. Okay. Snag that 79. It's, it's probably top four best champagnes I've ever had in my life. Is that right? Yeah. I don't and, like to tell everybody about it because I'm looking for it myself. Okay. <laughs> Just so, so would that be your favorite, your favorite rare champagne ever then is the 79? 79. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. The, the O2 has, a, has the closest place in my heart, but the 79 is of, for me the best I've ever had of the rares. It's just unbelievable. And so do you think the the O2 could get there with more time or do you think it's still just the Absolutely. 79? Okay. No, no. I think O2 definitely has a, the ageability and the capability. Even the 98 has the ageability and the capability. Because yeah, for me, I found that a lot of people either love really aged champagne or they hate it because a lot of people either like the defervescence and the really uh, intense flavors you get with brand new champagne or they appreciate more the, the complexity and the secondary aromas and tertiary characteristics and so forth that you get with some age, which are really, really mind blowing. But sometimes they're just expecting maybe what they have every day. And it's not maybe because it's not what they're used to. They, they don't really react favorably the first time they try it. Yeah, I, I definitely have seen that as well. It can be a bit polarizing, but the people who love it and can appreciate it, I think that you can really pull like these nuances out of it. That's just incredible i love those those old champagnes are so good and you know what's funny is that i mean if you're going to be losing the bubbles anyway i mean i'll even decant it for a little bit right You've, you get like one of like the decanters of the, like the 
kind of looks like horns, you know, and you just so gently pour it inside there and just let it do its thing and try to keep it like, like the actual decanter on ice a little bit, right? Just to keep that temperature down. And it's oof, so incredible. Absolutely. No. And in fact, uh, maybe seven, eight years ago, we used to try this experiment with, uh, with a non-vintage champagne. It was maybe a $30 at the time, uh, non-vintage mm-hmm. champagne, but we would decant it and let it aerate for maybe four hours. And then we would blind people on it at the end of the night. And they would guess it was Montrachet. Yeah. <laughs> because the exactly. aromatics just change so much. The effervescence is gone. But then you get those complex, amazing aromas. And, and they were all blinding it as Montrachet, which is, you know, at least 10 times the price. Yeah. <clears throat> no, no kidding. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's always a very fun exercise to do, right? You throw people off quite a bit with that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Getting to uh, Piper Hide Seek a little bit, uh, if people are interested in in value and high quality for the price, the bottlings, would you recommend? I mean, the Piper Hide Seek non-vintage brute, hands down, the red label is, I mean, for the price, it can't be beat. It's just solid year after year after year. Um, just the price is... I mean, it should be at least ten dollars more a bottle. It should be. I mean, it's in it, it bats in ten to twenty dollar category more more than it more than the price is. Um, you know, we put a good amount of of age on it. You know, we age it for close to four years on the lees. Um, you know, even a vintage champagne has to be aged for three years, and we're beyond that. You know, I think that it's it's great. I mean, we do twenty percent reserve wines dating up to twelve years. Beyond that, I mean, it's just we 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 definitely tend to go a bit above and beyond. Uh, with every with everything that we do with our houses, but I think that one is, I mean, for the money. Yeah, I mean, an absolute crowd pleaser. And what would the uh, the typical price point be in in the United States, for example, on that one? You could find it for right about just under forty dollars. Yeah, yeah, that is uh, an attractive value, certainly in terms of non vintage champagne. A lot of them have gone up so much in price now that it's hard to find anything below fifty dollars. That's the truth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, the Piper Isaac non-vintage brute was also the only champagne in the Spectator Top 100 this year. So it's, it's, it gets the recognition that's, that's due. But yeah, you know, the, the prices of grapes and champagne are the most expensive in the world. And because most of the people buy the grapes, unfortunately, the price of champagne goes up, right? Because the grape growers charge, they, they know what they have. But on the flip side of it, what I always think is funny about champagne is that champagne is in fact a value. When you talk about French wine, let me explain this. Get Grand Cru Burgundy. How much are you paying for it? Hundreds, yeah, thousands. Easy. Grand Cru, right? Um, you know, um, uh, Bordeaux, right? How much are you paying for it? Thousands, right? If you're talking like Cheval Blanc or you're talking Mouton Rothschild, I mean, Aubryon, I mean, so much money. You talk about Grand Cru Champagne, how much are you paying for it? Hundreds. It's a fraction of the cost. So I think a lot of people just need to remember that the grapes are the most expensive, but the, the quality delivers for the price. And do you still run to do uh, a lot of people who think the champagne is supposed to be only, uh, only open for celebrations and it's not something that's appropriate for every day? <laughs> no, no. Champagne's yeah. an everyday wine. All day, every day. And I also think that champagne is one of the few wines that can carry you through an entire meal, right? Because it has that great acidity to it, right? And if you watch cooking shows, right, like Top Chef, for example, what are they always talking about? The acidity, the acidity, the acidity in the food, right? It's the same with wine. You know, champagne has a great high acidity. It lends itself to pairing with probably more foods than anything else. Uh, I mean, you can go anywhere from, you know, oysters to steak. I, I pair rare and steak all the time. And it's a great pairing, in fact. Um, I also think that the, the yeah special occasions. I think that that's that needs to that, that needs to end. Yeah, because, it's certainly appropriate to drink it on special occasions, but it's it's also good every day as well. So. Absolutely, and also something to take note of um, the glasses, right? So I'm drinking out of my favorite. This is like the rare official glass. Oh yeah, yeah, right? I have a big one too. So. Yes, exactly. So I think these are a much better shape. And in Champagne, you'll very rarely find, uh, you know, the um, like the traditional Champagne flutes. They're great for seeing the bubbles, right? You can see the bubbles really well. But I think that if you're talking about real Champagne, like something serious, you want to be able to get your nose in there and smell it. Now, if you were to go uh, a flute, I prefer something kind of like this shape, right? It's more open. A little bit. Yeah, a little bit more bulbous. Uh, these are the Jamais, um, designed by a, a sommelier, um, uh, Champagne sommelier, Master Champagne sommelier in Champagne. And I think if you're going to go flute, you want something in between. This is a great shape to go. But just those straight, you know, classic ones. Mm, 
nobody drinks out of those in champagne for yeah. anymore, so, right? I, I don't do it either. So I, I use it for maybe sparkling water or something else, but never, never champagne, yeah. certainly. So no. where can we no, get no. the uh, the rare champagne glasses? We've had several people interested in those. Are those mm, things that are available those, or are those uh, special for you? Those are <laughs> not readily available right now, unfortunately. Uh, okay. I think that because of, uh, of all the COVID and all that, they've kind of, Nobody's been making anything at the moment, but okay. I'm sure I'm sure I can find a small amount to to if somebody DMs me, I'm sure I can figure out a small amount. Okay, great. Yeah, definitely lots of requests for those I've seen come across the wire. Yeah, they're beautiful. I love them. And so, so. in terms of uh, investment strategy, if people want to uh, in- invest in champagne, for example, what would your advice be in terms of how to go about it? Do you recommend buying on release and then aging some and maybe drinking a couple as you go? Or how would you... How would you go about it? Yes. Um, I recommend buying 12 bottles. Wait, drink one right away, see where it's at. Wait a couple of years, drink another one. I mean, if you're talking about like really expensive champagne, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Wait a couple of years, drink another one. Wait a couple of years, drink another one. You can really kind of see how that evolves, right? Until, until you get to a point where you're 20 years deep and then you're finally drinking your, your last bottle. You know, and I think storage is a very important thing with champagne too. I, um, I can't tell you how many times I go to my friend's houses and they just have a bottle of champagne sitting on top of their fridge. Oh yeah. And they're like, for special <laughs> occasions, they're like, no, right? Because like you're going to get all these temperature fluctuations, which are something you're really not looking for in champagne, right? Because it's a pressurized product. So even temperature out of the sunlight, um, those are the most important. If you can try to eliminate some sort of vibration, right? Sometimes people have it like on top of weird places that have vibration and you know, I've seen them get messed up like that, but really it's sunlight. And like these huge temperature variances that will, it's the quickest way to destroy a bottle. Uh, if you don't have a wine fridge, put it in the deepest, darkest part of your, col- of your closet, right? Yep. That's, and, that's, and you don't that's want to put it in the refrigerator for too long because the cork could dry out. You could get some oxygen in there. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, you can keep it in your fridge for a good, a good moment, right? I always have champagne in my fridge, but I think that, you know, six months tops, right. uh, unless you're doing like a wine fridge. Uh, after that, just drink it, get another bottle in the fridge. Yeah, that's such a shame about, about the size of the bottles, right? And I mean, the reason for that is, um, you know, we're, we're talking about 90 PSI inside of a bottle, right? Car tires, 30 PSI. Uh, if they were the same thickness as like a normal wine bottle, I mean, you've got potentials for explosions. And that actually originally happened. Um, you know, originally champagne, the bubbles were a fault. Uh, for those who don't know that. And uh, it was actually the English who, who kind of solved that problem because they were uh, making their glass with coal, uh, which tends to make a much stronger glass versus uh, wood-fired. Um, so it was actually the English who kind of allowed those bubbles to originally happen. And those English, they drink a lot of champagne. I'll tell they you. They do, yeah. So what are, what are some of your biggest markets then for, uh, for rare champagne or, or probably hide-seek as well? Um, yeah, uh, Japan, Australia. I mean, U.S. is number two right behind France. Uh, UK is really big. Um, yeah, Australia, Japan, um, China, you know, there's a Korea is doing pretty well. Yeah, but, but rare champagne is available in, in Canada and also, um, mm-hmm. Quebec, I think may have a separate structure. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, I don't cover Quebec, so I don't know all the details about it. I just do all the way to Toronto. Okay. But, Any other advice you'd like to give to our, our champagne drinkers? Any other advice? Um, yes. Drink champagne every day. Your life will be happy. I've never seen anybody sad drinking champagne. That's true. If you're sad, you drink it and you have a smile. If you're happy, you drink it. You have a bigger smile, right? I agree. No, that always works that way. So, And it's also somewhat lower in alcohol, so it doesn't, yep. it doesn't have the same problem like when people drink whiskey and you know, it hits exactly. them too hard. They want to kick someone's butt or something. You, know, you don't have any of that. Everyone's just uh, very happy and in a good mood whenever they drink champagne. Exactly. And, and also what's interesting is because of the bubbles, because of the carbon gases, it gets into your bloodstream quicker. So you get there quicker, but you stay there longer, right? So it has this great balance, you know? Oh, is that right? It's because of the effervescence that you, you feel it faster? Exactly. Yeah. So you get there quicker, you stay there better, you stay that good buzz. You don't go over the top too easily which is a great place to be. No, and I, t- I completely agree with you, though, that uh, you can drink it throughout the course of an entire meal. Uh, mm-hmm. And sometimes you mix it up a little bit from, from entree to, uh, you know, from uh, appetizer to entree. But I- I've done that n- a number of times, actually paired every single course with a different champagne, and it works incredibly well. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I mean, even Piper Heidsick makes a, um, something called the Sublime, which is a demi-sec. 
uh, which has about 36 grams per liter of sugar. And that's amazing with desserts, especially things like sticky toffee pudding, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of like those like caramelly based desserts. I mean, it's just spectacular. And, and you mentioned earlier that the, the rare champagne would go well with a steak, but then also those, uh, those rosé champagnes where they have a higher percentage of the still red wine, where it's a little mm -hmm. bit more like a burgundy. I've paired those with a, with a steak as well, and that works incredibly well. You couldn't be more right. I love that pairing. Absolutely love it. It's just, it's got like that boldness, you know? Yeah, that high Pinot Noir really um, lends itself well to like that red meat, right? It just adds that extra little bit of structure and depth. And, and, and champagne and popcorn as well is uh, something that's always fun to snack on. So that's another, uh, another fan favorite, I think. So. Yep. Popcorn, potato chips. You just, you can't go wrong. Champagne goes with everything. You it does, yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, Definitely appreciate you, so you joining us. And uh, we've certainly learned a lot about rare champagne and look forward to uh, pursuing some of those other bottles that uh, sounds like the, uh, the 79 and the, uh, the 88 may still be available. The yep, 98 exactly. and Magnum is still mm -hmm. available. And uh, of course, the 06 is readily available and there may still be some 02 on the shelves. And then the 07, exactly. the 08 rosé may still be around as well. So a high percentage of the, of the vintages should still be available if people uh, pursue them aggressively enough. Absolutely. Absolutely. Perfect. Thanks so much. Well, Cheers. Cheers.